three, one, two, two. What's that? We're live. Sweet. Okay, everybody. Um, we are live, and we're actually um, video this and running at Facebook Live as well. So if you have any friends who missed it, um, know that we've got it. It's out there on Facebook, and we'll also be putting it out. Welcome. I really appreciate everyone taking the time and showing up to, to learn a little bit more about your body. Um, that's always the first step in getting healthier and getting more fit and just being able to do what we want to do in a more efficient way. My name um, is Curtis Cramblett. I've um, been a physical therapist for over 25 years now, as well as a strength and conditioning coach, a cycling coach, and do a lot of education for um, physical therapists on a, on a master's postgraduate level, as well as just the average public. And I, I really appreciate you guys um, making time out of a busy day to, to come down here and learn a little more. Let me sit this down. And all you um, abroad just kind of um, watching in. So today we're, we're here to talk about the foot, but I really want to connect it into the system. And if um, you were here for our last lecture, um, you'll see a little bit of the same, especially in the beginning. And then we'll dive a, a whole bunch of deeper into the foot. So um, the foot, has anyone in here have a foot issues? Yeah, like, right? Like, did you show up a foot lecture? So how many of you had foot issues and then you noticed later on uh, it started to bother anything further up the body? Was that true for anybody? It started to bother, yeah? The knee. Started to bother the knee and lower the pelvis, lower back. And that's hips. That's so common, uh, the other ankle even. That, that's so common what I hear is it starts out at one problem and that onion just keeps growing. That onion of accommodation, it goes from the, the foot to the knee and the knee to the back. And it might skip apart as far as pain. You know, it might not actually hurt in the knee initially, but then the low back or even the neck starts to hurt. Because this really is an interconnected chain. And through that chain, we, we start out with foot problems, and we'll talk a little bit more about these as we go along. Maybe it's a bunion, or maybe it's some shin splints, or maybe it's plantar fasciitis. It starts out as one of these old things, an old ankle sprain when we were in high school. And then the next thing you know, we end up here. Uh, we end up needing to look through the system to figure out what's the underlying driver, and so many times that comes back to the foot. Because most people walk in and keep saying, my knee hurts, or my back hurts, or my neck hurts. And they, we keep cleaning up these messes off the floor. We put a Band-Aid on the knee, even though it's coming from the foot. Or we put a Band-Aid on the back, even though it's coming from the foot. And we just keep cleaning up the mess on the floor. And so my job, or our job as physical therapists, is to really look at the system and say, your back hurts, and we need to treat your back. But really, your foot is the uh, worst thing started from, and what we really need to work on the most. Because too many times we just end up treating the symptoms, the knee pain, the low back pain, instead of really looking for the, the causes, if you will, the criminals and the victims. The victims tend to be the neck, the back, the hip, the knee, and the criminals, the underlying foot issue. So this is um, really an interconnected chain, and if we're going to really understand where things are coming from, we need to talk about the body as a system. Um, how many people in here have heard of fascia? Anybody? Yeah, awesome. That, that layer of essentially skin under the skin that starts from one place in the body and then lands all the way up into the head. This is just one line of that fascia called the superficial back line, labeled by Thomas Myers. Um, but there's these lines that run down the front of us. And it's really fun to dissect these things. And you can literally see, well, the muscle starts at one place and ends at another. But then the fascia continues up into the next muscle and then continues up into the next muscle. So we have these, quote, tight hamstrings, and then you loosen up the calf or the foot, and all of a sudden the hamstrings, in quotes, have more flexibility. It's a, like, a, it's like a string, a very long string, and then not anywhere in that string will impede the length of the entire string. So understanding these systems of fascia run up and down the body and even across the body, so sometimes we get a knot in the calf or in the foot, and our opposite pelvis starts to hurt because of that knot. So this is um, a tensegrity system, if you will, much like a bicycle wheel where any one spoke on the wheel that's too tight or too loose, too tight or too loose, or too tight or too loose, any one spoke on the wheel will send the whole wheel out of true or out of round. 
uh, and that what happens when the foot hits the ground or when the foot hits the pedal, um, we start to end up with these systems that drop in or fall. And the next thing you know, the knee is collapsing and the back is twisting uh, just because one spoke, a la the foot's not working as efficiently as it needs to be. And that knee starts to drive in and it starts to hurt if the inside arch isn't supported well. So that's the big picture, and if, uh, those of you who were here last time heard a little bit more about that. But let's dive into the intricacies of the foot. Um, Kim, if you're in audio range, um, uh, no. Um, Trevor, if you can go there, grab a foot model for me. I'll stay inside. So I want to just take a minute um, to go into some of the bones of the foot, uh, just to get you some of the basic anatomy. So we basically divide the foot up into three regions. The front of the foot called the forefoot, which is kind of these um, finger-like projections. Thank you very much, appreciate that. If you will, the, the quote fingers of the foot, the phalanges, and then the, the metatarsals just behind them. The front of the foot's really meant to be this wonderful mobile adapter that when our foot hits the ground, can we get the big toe down to the ground? Can we adapt to a ground that's changing in surfaces? So the front of the foot, really that mobile adapter. And you can feel this on yourself and especially feel how the inside of the foot is so much more mobile, if you will, than the outside. Just the way the bones line up over here, we end up with a very mobile forefoot and a very mobile inside of the foot relative to the outside of the foot. This is a right foot, by the way, big toe on this side. So we've got the, the forefoot or the front of the foot, the phalanges and the, the metatarsals. And then behind that, we have the midfoot, kind of this chunk in here. This chunk in here that looks like this. How many bones do you think we have in the foot? Anybody? 26 bones in the foot. And each one of those bones is connected to the next bone by muscles and by ligaments. And those bones are supposed to be able to be a bit floppy. And for so many of us, this mid-tarsal row gets very, very stiff. It gets locked up here, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in a minute, but this mid-tarsal row, when it can't move well, then it's frequently what drives the rest of the foot and the rest of the chain down. So we've got our mid-tarsal row, and for those PTs, um, how many medical professionals, physical therapists, personal trainers, Pilates instructors are in the audience? Awesome, just so I know who I'm talking to. So that mid-tarsal row here, uh, on the outside, we've got our cuboid bone, and then a couple of cuneiforms coming across the front, and then our talus uh, kind of in the middle of that, and our navicular in the middle of that here. A lot of people talk about pronation or that ability for the foot to drop in, and frequently they look at that bone there and talk about how much is that middle bone or that, the middle of the arch dropping down, that navicular bone collapsing down in the ground. So that's our midfoot, if you will. And finally, our rear foot. Our rear foot, a la um, the rudder of the foot, uh, wherever this big bone in the back goes, frequently it drives the rest of the bones. The calcaneus, and then the, just above that, the talus, if you will, the subtalar joint for those of you in the physical therapy or anatomy world. This is the, the bone that has to be able to twist in and twist out. It also has a whole lot of rotational capacity, very responsible for appropriate and efficient pronation of the foot. So this is, if you will, the rear foot, and the rear foot moves in all three dimensions, not just side to side, but for those um, physios out there, personal trainers, the primary motion of your calcaneus on the talus, and you can see it here, is actually rotation in this side to side or transverse plane. A lot of people think about this joint doing a whole lot of this, and it does some of that, but its primary motion is in this, this rotational capacity. It's supposed to be one of the primary transducers when the foot hits the ground to be able to control that twisting of the heel. So that's the basic anatomy of the foot. And then let's just jump up one to the ankle. The ankle is the joint just above it here between talus and anybody know what that big bone is down here? Tibia. Yeah. And then the bone on the outside, the fibula. So the ankle is mostly made up of this joint here between the talus and the tibia, but a lot of people forget to actually treat and mobilize that connection between your fibula and your talus as well. And this bone can get jammed up or jammed down, and frequently there's a lot of stuff that happens out here when we sprain our ankle. Our big ligaments, and we'll see that in a minute, come from the outside of this, this bone out here, your fibula, down into your calcaneus. 
So there's the, um, there's the ankle joint itself. The ankle joint is very much responsible for this motion, this kind of hinge motion. In our world, we call it dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Basically, it's what has to happen when you squat. So that's the ankle. What many times happens is instead of a good alignment of the back of the calcaneus and the tibia, we end up with one of these. We end up with a calcaneus on the inside, a la shifted, because we've done some sort of a sprain. And instead of having a nice line there for that hinge joint, we end up with a bit of a tip or even a bit of a shear of that bone underneath when people sprain their ankles. And these things tend to not go back by themselves in one way or another. In other words, people will have ankle sprains in... 5, 10, 20 years later, the research shows that people still have mechanical issues down here and the capacity of this bone to move efficiently 20 years after that ankle sprain still isn't working well and their coordination and balance down here is less. That's why a lot of times we'll have these old ankle sprains when we're kids and next thing you know, 5, 10, 20 years later, it's that knee or that hip and it started down here because we ended up with an ankle bone that's not in the same line as the bones above it. In order for the body to work efficiently, we need these bones in a, an efficient mechanical alignment. So that's the calcaneus. Any questions about the basic anatomy of the foot? Yeah, people are good with that. So that's the bony anatomy. Now let's talk about the ligaments of the foot. This is the outside of the foot here. This is the inside of the foot. And on the outside of the foot is where we tend to sprain our ankle the most. These, these outside ligaments, calcaneal fibular, and I'll just call them the outside ligaments for the moment, they're most likely, on this outside, they're most likely to get sprained when we do that traditional roll our foot to the outside. Um, and these ligaments, there's three of them. We usually get the first and then the middle, and if you're unlucky enough to get the back one, that's when the ankle starts to really get unstable. And each successive ankle sprain, and most people have more than one, each successive ankle sprain tends to strain them a little bit further back or sprain them a little further back, causing more challenges. The next set of ligaments is the ligaments on the inside of the ankle, on the medial aspect of the ankle. Collectively, they're called the deltoid ligament. They're a whole lot harder to, on the inside of the ankle, they're a whole lot harder to sprain. Doesn't happen as much for your ankle to twist to the inside or to get bent up. Very rarely do people sprain um, these guys, but it definitely happens, especially in big traumas or um, big impact traumas. And then uh, the other one I wanted to point out, and I think it landed here. Eh, it didn't land here very well. You can kind of see it right here. There's this ligament that goes between the tib and the fib. Uh, many times if anybody has had a high ankle sprain, if you will, um, these two bones can get pulled apart. And this high ankle sprain is the spraining of that ligament that connects those two, the, the, the tib-fib or a high ankle sprain, if you will. Okay, there's another one. You can see the ligaments through here and some of the, the ligaments across the back. But what I really want to pull your attention to is these guys, your arches. Most people think about um, the inside arch of the foot. Again, this is a right foot, big toe side here. Most people think about the inside arch. And that arch is the most common one to collapse in an inefficient way when we hit the ground. But these, this arch is just as important as the arch that comes, and you can kind of see it here, the arch that comes across the top, or if you will, the bottom of the foot. This transverse or a cross arch makes sure that your foot doesn't splat too much when your foot hits the ground. And it's important for keeping these nerves in here. If anybody's had metatarsalgia, these metatarsal bones, there's these little nerves and blood vessels that go through here. And when the foot starts to splat and collapse, splat's the technical term, by the way, when the foot starts to hit the ground and you can't maintain these, this arch, the nerves in here can either get friction or they can get compressed between there and the bottom of the shoe, uh, whether it be a regular shoe or maybe a cycling shoe. And then the last arch, um, as you can actually see it here, is the outside of the foot. This arch, just because of the bones that live out here, tends to be the most stable of the three arches. And actually, frequently, there's a lot of stiffness in this outside arch, where this arch is the one that can't bend and can't move appropriately. So three arches, a transverse arch, an outside or a lateral arch, and an inside or a medial arch. Next, muscular anatomy. 
there are a lot of muscles that go into the foot. Collectively, I'm going to say that there are the muscles that are inside or intrinsic to the foot, and then there's the muscles that come out of the foot and run back up into the front of the shin or back up into the back of the calf. I just want to highlight two muscles because they're going to be really important for our function and our walking, not that all the others aren't. There's these two muscles called the fibularis longus and the tibialis posterior. And they're really important because our foot, I was talking about it earlier, has this necessity of when the foot hits the ground, it has to be able to adapt, to give way, be mobile in the ground. But the other side of the gait cycle, the other side of walking cycle, is when we go to push off. And so when we push off the ground, we probably don't want our foot to collapse a lot. When we push on the, off the ground, we want our foot to be a rigid lever, if you will. But if this inside arch has all of this mobility, it doesn't transfer force to the ground very well, or to the pedal, or to the running. So in order for this inside arch to become an arch, versus the flattened, the splat, the twist, in order for this arch to become an arch and be stable there, there's a couple of muscles that attach to the inside bottom of the foot, basically underneath the ball of the foot, kind of back in here, that tibialis posterior, fibularis longus, and pronius longus is actually the third one I needed to mention. The pronius longus, those muscles bring this foot from a relaxed position back into an arch position. So these muscles provide stability for that medial, more mobile arch. And if those muscles can't get that big toe down on the ground, no matter how much mobility you have in the foot, if those muscles can't plant that big toe on the ground, all of a sudden you're left with a structure like this that's trying to support you, and that structure is a whole lot less biomechanically efficient than this structure. So basically what I'm saying, if, if those muscles aren't working right, your foot can't put itself into a stable position, and the next thing you know, you've got inefficient pronation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, cool. That makes sense for the rest. Yeah, yeah, cool. Cool is the right word. So pronation and supination is, is so yes, please. So for those muscles you're talking about, if those are all below the knee between the ankles. Ah, thank you for that. Um, because sometimes things aren't obvious. So this right here is your femur, and there's right there is your knee joint, and this is the below your knee. Yeah. So they, these are basically, I should say, these are your deep calf muscles. Your calf muscle, your gastroc and your soleus attaches to your, your heel down here. And if I pulled your calf muscle away, you would find this muscle setting there, these couple muscles. Yeah, they're the deep calf muscles just of your lower shin. Thank you for that. Keep asking me those questions because the obvious isn't obvious at all. Yeah, beautiful. Yes, exactly. So if I took the gastroc and the soleus and I peeled them off, you would see those muscles just below. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, other questions? That's your job to make sure that you understand things because I'll put it out there and it won't make any sense for any of us. Okay, others? Sweet. Okay, question for everyone. Is pronation a bad thing? Is pronation a bad thing? What do you guys think? Bad, good, what's that? I think yes. Yeah. Too much, yeah, what'd you say? I said yes. Yes. Pronation is actually not a bad thing. Too much is a bad thing, and inefficient pronation is a bad thing. Let's define it for a moment. The foot is a whole lot like the hand. And I want you to take your hand and put it on your thigh. Everyone's got their hand on their thigh. The big toe is obviously unstable at the moment. Um, <laughs> the big toe is obviously, I'll just do it up here. Uh, the big toe is obviously the thumb. And when you have efficient pronation, what I want you to do is just flatten your hand. That's efficient pronation. All the bones of the foot, um, all the bones of the foot, and I'm going to go over here, all the bones of the foot flatten out efficiently, and they kind of spread out like a triangle. And what I mean by that is if your heel, I'm going to jump back, jump back, there we go. So if your, yeah, if your heel is in the back and your big toe is on one side and your little toe is on the other, when your foot splats, can you see how everything gets longer? That is efficient pronation. Our foot hits the ground, our big toe hits the ground, and we efficiently pronate. Everyone good with that? 
Now what I want you to do, and again, imagine that's your big toe. I want you to pull your big toe and the ball of the foot up. Now, when that hits the ground, what happens? Is the ground, is the ground flat? Yes. Is your big toe meeting the ground? I'm going to do it up here, just like that. Can you see that? So here is a foot efficiently hitting the ground. Now, I've just asked you to lift up the first metatarsal. And then I've said, now let's go get to the ground. What happens to the rest of the system? It's that picture that you saw earlier. When the big toe can't get to the ground, something else has to. Yeah? And now all of a sudden, your knees dropped in, your shin is rotated, maybe your pelvis is twisted. All kinds of things happen when you have this unstable system above it. So that's inefficient pronation, or what frequently people talk about is this bone right here, the navicular drops down and this inside arch collapses. The visual I like a whole lot, and I'll bring this over here as well, the visual I like a whole lot is if this is your big, this is a right foot, this is your big toe, this is your little toe, and this is your heel, in an efficient state, this big toe can put itself down on the ground and it can be quite stable. What happens many times because of either tightness or because of coordination, that ball of the foot can't get to the ground, and then all of a sudden, that happens to the knee. It's what you've been seeing with your hand. Um, and not only does it just drop in, but as you can kind of see here, as it drops in, it tends to twist in as well, causing a rotation. Yes. So if you found an orthotic, that effectively gives you the force. That's correct. Like extending the leg of the tripod. Bingo. Is that correct? That is correct. So an orthotic helps start to bring the ground up to a foot that can't efficiently get to the ground. Yeah, it makes sense. And sometimes an orthotic, whether that be a real orthotic or whether that be some sort of a, let me put this down, stay, good tripod. Um, or we use these some in bicycle shoes. This has got a thick side and a thin side and we bring the ground up to the foot, this little bit of a lift, a couple of millimeters. Uh, if people can't get their foot down there, the crutch, if you will, the short-term band-aid is to bring the ground up to the foot, whether that be through an orthotic, a support of some sort. Yes, great question. So orthotics help bring the ground up to the foot so that the foot doesn't have to collapse into the ground. Yes. I just want to make sure I understand pronation. I always yes. see people walking like this. Ah, yes. That's not pronation. That is not pronation. What do you call that? Um, that is an, a twisting out or an external rotation of the lower legs. Like yeah, either walking or running like this. When I say pro, when I say pronation, I mean the flattening of the foot is in a hole. It's exactly what you felt with your hand. Okay. When you turn your leg out, and watch me here. When you turn your leg out uh, and you walk through, what happens then is an inefficient pronation. You get this collapsing and twisting. Okay. You get so there's efficient pronation, which is the flattening and spreading. This bone goes long and that bone goes long. And then you turn your leg out, you get a little bit of stiffness in the foot, and now the foot does that. Yeah. So pronation should not have that much rotation to it. It should be mostly this and a little bit of that. Does that, does that help out? Yeah. So yes, other questions? If your foot, if you use a Yes. Yeah. It's a really good question. It's that kind of general question for me is when do we use a crutch, essentially? And an orthotic is a wonderful crutch to bring the ground up and help the body out until it doesn't need to be helped out anymore. Um, so for me, very supportive shoes is a great example. You know, 10 years ago, unless I had a very supportive shoe with an orthotic in it, my knee and my back hurt. Until I actually started to get my shoe, until I started to get my feet more mobile and stronger, and then I gradually worked my way initially out of the orthotic, 
and then finally out of um, shoes that gave me a whole lot of support. So you're right that a crutch, an orthotic, gives the body a lot of support and that um, if you only wore that, you'd be in a lot of trouble. But if you need it, if it's the only way to get your foot and your knee to function well, then you should absolutely use it. And so what we usually say is you use as much support as you need and then you take away that support over time. It's the crutch, if you will, that you gradually decrease. It's a really good question. And it's a good big picture question. It's like people that need low back braces. Okay, for right now, it's exactly what you need. And then later on, we want to get you strong enough so that you don't need it. What happens many times is if you don't give the body enough support, then it can't work well. And as, when the more it works improperly, the body never has a chance of getting stronger. Uh, as soon as you give it a little bit of support, then the muscles kick in. And then once they're awake, then you start to take that support away. Yeah, does that help? Yeah, really important question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, they they are, and they're very cushiony as well. So, I'm saying I need to meet the person exactly where they're at. I need to figure out what you need today, and then in the long term, I want to give you less support and less shock absorption because your body gets better at doing it itself. Probably not. Probably not. And then I need to know where, where you're at. But yeah, um, highly supportive shoes. Uh, it's a whole lot better to work your way down to less supportive shoes as you can. And like I said, it took me two years of consistent intervention to go from a Hoka-like shoe down to something that's minimally supportive. And I can't yet go to a fully non-supportive shoe. Then my body starts to say, you don't have enough strength for that yet, uh, but I'm getting there. It's a that over time, but the answer to your question is, yeah, I like to get people away from more supportive shoes, more cushiony shoes when their body says they're ready. Really good question. Yes. End up in a neutral shoe. Yeah, yeah, one that doesn't. Say the last part again. You might need a more supportive shoe. You probably need a supportive shoe. And you might need an orthotic. Um, you might need a shim in your cycling shoe. You know, all kinds of things to help meet your. But yeah, you're absolutely right. If you're having some pain, there's a decent chance you might need some more support. Because so many people, um, we're going to get to it in a moment, but there's some research out there. Of, they, they looked at a lot of kids who grew up barefoot versus the, the kids in other states. And guess what? If you grow up using these muscles and the brain uses the foot, you're stronger by the time you're a teenager. Um, people, uh, kids jumped longer. They, I believe, ran faster. And there's one other. Um, it basically, when you use it, it gets stronger. And when you don't use it, you support it a lot. It gets weaker and it gets dumb. The foot just gets dumb if we don't use it. We lock it up in a shoe where we don't ask our foot to work and it just gets um, very immobile and very uncoordinated. Yes? Um, how does that change when somebody has flat feet? How does that change when someone has flat feet? Yeah, so for me, um, when, I, when I hear flat feet, uh, flat foot, I think about a foot that's very pronated in an efficient way, if you will. They're not... Flat is not inefficient pronation. Is that how you're defining it? Pez cavus? Yeah. Yeah. It works. So um, I'm going to take that as, as someone has a flat foot. They've efficiently pronated, but they're just stuck down here. They're not here. Okay. So when someone has a very flat foot, usually I find that when you can get some support underneath them, it helps the muscles that haven't been able to engage for When a joint is stretched to its very end, muscles can't work very well. And so usually when you give that foot a little bit of support, give it a little bit of an arch inside the shoe, muscles that haven't worked in a long time now have an opportunity because they're not at the end of their stretch curve, length tension curve for those of you in there. So usually I, I build up a little bit of support and then I start to train the heck out of those muscles. You know, get the intrinsic muscles of the foot stronger, get the extrinsic muscle of the foot stronger, and then I actually start to see some arch come at least functionally meaning the brain can start to control some of that flattening out of the foot. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Perfect. Thank you for the questions. I really appreciate the interaction. Anatomical short leg. Anatomical short leg. Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, when people have a, um, a structurally short leg, whether it be from the femur or the tibia, um, that um, sometimes there's been an injury, sometimes it's just the way they've grown. The strengthening the foot doesn't change their need for um, a leg length. So when that leg is short, it's going to make the whole body collapse no matter how strong you get the foot. So I keep that support in there. Now, how much they need if they're a centimeter short, frequently by the time I, you know, I meet them as an adult, usually giving them all of their length usually isn't helpful. Usually it's somewhere between a quarter and maybe three quarters. So if they're short by a centimeter, a half a centimeter, even a quarter centimeter, usually they're healthier with a quarter or half than they are with all of it. And you said something important, which is a heel lift. If they're short in their tibia, I don't lift the heel, I lift the whole foot. Something either inside the shoe that's the whole length of the foot, or something, if it's a significant, I have people go out and build up their shoes. So I, um, so strengthening the foot won't take care of the, um, take care of the leg length discrepancy. You need to usually support for it. And I find somewhere between, uh, just to trans, uh, just to convert centimeters, somewhere a half an inch is about a centimeter. So and when people get above about a quarter an inch, about a half a centimeter, or certainly by the time they get to a centimeter, a leg length, a shim is quite helpful for people. Yeah, it's an insole across the entire foot inside the shoe or outside if it gets too thick. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Great question. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and if I forget, remind me. And I think I got that one, but I haven't gotten them all. Perfect. Keep asking the questions. That's why we're here for you guys to learn. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah, use the, the, the idea is to use the support and then train the body up to be able to do without. Except if you've got a structural leg length discrepancy and you were born with a short leg because there's no way to train in a longer leg. And structural, I mean bony, uh, because there are people with leg length discrepancies that come from twisted pelvises and such. And even that's a great example. If you've got a twisted pelvis and one leg is short because you've got these tightnesses up here, for a short period, I will put something underneath that leg because people's cores work better and their legs work better. And then I start to take it out as they get healthier. You know, their back is all tightened up, and every time they walk, they collapse, and their back hurts. I bring the ground up to them it's part of the way, then they get healthier, and their leg gets longer as they get more mobile, and then I take it away. Give the crutch as long as you need it, and then gradually ease it out is the big picture. Yes? What if you have your knee replaced, and they find that there's a little difference in the... Leg length discrepancy. Yeah. So common with knee replacement and hip replacements that you end up with a leg length discrepancy. And many times, um, balancing you out to some extent can make a really big difference for the whole chain. I did it for a while and then I, I quit. Yeah. And how did you feel when you did it? Well, I have other problems. You have other problems. We'll leave that alone. Uh, awesome. So most of the time, people, when they go back and forth, if they got a true leg length discrepancy, if they do the test, they find that some amount of leveling them out usually helps. I have ankle problems, probably from spraining when I was a little kid. Yeah, old ankle problems from spraining when you were a kid. That's so common. Those old ankle injuries, those old ankle sprains, they come back to haunt us a little bit later on. That was when I was 10. Now I'm 80. Yeah, you've had a lot of years to compensate. <laughs> <laughs> well, only a couple of years to compensate. That's what I meant. <laughs> so let's dive in a little bit more. So efficient pronation is that appropriate flattening or opening of the foot. Supination is just the opposite. It's the ability for the foot essentially to get into that position. And that's what happens when we push off. Um, these bones roll up into their arch. This becomes a rigid lever, and that's what we use for pushing, whether it's pushing when we're running, uh, whether it's pushing when we're jumping, or even pushing down on the pedal. The foot needs to be able to roll up into that. That long arch gets shorter, and then we're able to stabilize because of the position, and we're able to produce power there. 
So you, are you a tipper? And just think about that. And the general, what generally happens is these bones get stiff, they get tight, they get locked up, and then our body collapses into inefficient pronation because of that tightness. People have inefficient pronation most of the time. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, to fully rehabilitate, we need to work on all three components, and most of the time people don't work on all three components of a dysfunction. And I'll go into them in a moment. Mechanical, loosen up what's tight. Next, wake up what's asleep. Get that neuromuscular control, that coordination. And then finally, once you have good movement patterns, good form, the brain can engage the right muscles at the right time, then work on strength and endurance. Let's dive into that for a moment. So we have this um, fascia here, and this is actually fascia from an elbow that's been in a brace for two weeks, and that elbow didn't have any problems to begin with. Another two, in other words, two weeks, this fascia has some space, this fascia is glued together. Right here, this is all bunched up, and things can't move very well. Or with one of my patients, let's see if that'll roll. Will that roll for me? Yeah, there we go. So you might be able to see this dent right here. My, this, is a, this is an ankle and this is the, um, the calf. There's the Achilles tendon here. And when this patient bends the foot up, when they, they flex their foot up this way, you can see that this bump right here, these are cups, this bump right here doesn't do anything. This is nice and mobile. But can you see this dent right here? Every time they try to flex their Achilles tendon, this is where they've got some adhesions, this mechanical stuckness is something that came from an old Achilles tendon injury. But this could have come, this could be their mid-back from bending over a bike. This could be their mid-back from bending over a computer. This could be a foot that's been stuck in a shoe for a long time. The big picture here is in order to get healthy, we need to work on these tightnesses, these stiffnesses. This is where physical therapists, chiropractors, massage therapists, our personal trainers can get in and start to mobilize tight tissues whether those tight tissues be fascia and Achilles tendon, or whether they be a joint in the knee, the back, or the hip. Frequently, we break out all kinds of cruel little tools. Um, yeah, right? Um, Graston is one of my fame, fun ones. Uh, balls and tools to get some hands-on help. Because most of the time, just if you take a rubber band and you put a knot in that rubber band and you start to stretch on that rubber band, that knot never gets any looser. You stretch on a rubber band with a knot in it, you, you stretch out your Achilles tendon in your calf and you've got a knot in it, that knot, that knot never really changes position. You need to get your fingers in there. You need to get someone's hands in there to start to very specifically untie that knot. Sometimes I like to say it's like chiseling away at Mount Rushmore uh, because sometimes we have 70 years of dysfunction that's been piled on top of that old ankle injury. So we need to start to loosen up the tight calves, loosen up the tight knees and hips, um, whether it be at the midfoot, whether it be at the heel, uh, whatever that looks like. And I'm going to demo some of this uh, with Joel in a couple of minutes. But re uh, regaining the mobility around those stiff areas as opposed to treating the area that hurts. Um, one of my colleagues used to say we have these silent stiffnesses, these criminals, and then we have these areas of the body that hurt because they're having to accommodate for the criminals. It'd be like if I pulled on someone's hair and I said, well, I'm sorry your head hurts, we're just going to keep putting a Band-Aid on your head. The criminal is yanking on the head. The ankle is yanking on the knee and the hip. So number two, we need to start to wake up the muscle memory, if you will. So I was talking about some of the deep muscles of the foot that are responsible for getting the foot in an efficient position. This, is, um, this area here is called the homunculus of the brain. And frequently what happens is this motor control area, this conductor, a conductor just like an orchestra, this conductor part of the brain gets the software out of date. And so we just need to reload or reboot that muscle memory. We start to learn to walk like we have a rock in our shoe. And so we have a rock in our shoe, and for 60, 70 years, we walk like we have a rock in our shoe, that old ankle sprain. And even once I come back here and I chisel away that rock, we still have a muscle memory 
or a motor habit. The brain still tells the body to walk like you have a rock in your shoe. And so until you start to teach the body how to move efficiently again, this is what we like to call neuromuscular control or motor control, until you start to wake up the brain to move efficiently, you're going to keep moving wrong. And these things last for, for decades, like literally for decades. You stick a, a needle in the low back and look at how well the low back muscles are working 10 years after a low back injury, and those muscles on that side are still out to lunch. You know, that instrument in the orchestra, ha orchestra hasn't come back and played for decades. It forgets how to. The foot has had an ankle sprain, and those deep muscles in the foot forget how to. So this comes back to that, that research I pointed to earlier. Motor skills of children and ad adolescents are influenced by growing up barefoot or shod. I allow with shoes. Barefoot children uh, aged six to ten years old, six to ten years old, scored higher in the balance jump test and standing lo long jump. Habitually barefoot adolescents between 15 and 18 years of age showed a greater long jump distance. Basically, the footwear pattern that we have gets us in trouble. Now, there was a little bit of contradictory research in here uh, around some fast running, and there's, there's some questions about why. But generally, it's what I see. When people are able to go from a very supportive shoe, which is where I was, into a shoe that has less support when they have the strength and the coordination and the flexibility to be able to do it, their whole body tends to be happier. Um, so we've swung from, you know, very supportive shoes over to minimalist and no shoes, and now we're swinging back the pendulum to very supportive shoes. The answer is it's all right, and we need to figure out what's right for you right now. Yeah, that's the answer, and it's the answer for most things, honestly. Please. In the house, I go barefoot. Yes. I don't know what your feet are telling me. In the, in the house, you go barefoot. The, the short answer is probably it's a great thing. Uh, it helps, the, helps your brain wake up to the ground. I just don't like shoes. Yeah. You don't have to wear them inside. And so if, if you were 10 years old and that's what you did for 60 years of your life, your body would love it. Uh, and sometimes it's what I need to say to people is you run around in the house barefoot and right now your foot needs support and that's not what you need right now. But I don't know what your truth is right now. Your, the, many times the body tells us what that truth is and sometimes it doesn't. So the short answer is I don't know about you, but it's a great habit when we have the strength to be able to do it. You hate shoes. <laughs> and if we, if we took care of our kids that way, they would, have, they would be a lot healthier, honestly. They'd be a lot healthier if they spent less time in shoes. I did that as a child. Yeah, and that, that speaks to good things. By the way, great colors of those shoes. Oh, I love them. <laughs> we won't catch those on video, but I, those are cute. Uh, great questions. Other questions? Keep asking. Okay, so if number one is we've got to untie the tight stuff, get rid of the rocks, Number two is we've got to improve the brain's coordination, uh, re-educating optimal motion. That's essentially what this is. Our brains are programmable, and we are the programmers. We're responsible for retraining. Because we have to activate the right muscles at the right time, in the right amount, in the correct sequence. It's complicated. This, this conductor has to activate the right muscles at the right time, in the right amount, in the correct sequence. And then remember to turn those muscles off appropriately. Because some of us have just learned to tighten this muscle because our neck used to hurt. Or we've learned to tighten our foot because we had an ankle sprain. And we not only don't tighten up the right muscles in the right way, but we forget to relax the wrong muscles, and they're holding us rigid. And rigidity is just as big of a problem as too much, um, too much movement. Okay. Yeah, I'll leave that alone. Training neuromuscular control, I'm going to do a demo of this. NRM is neuromuscular control and motor control, and we'll talk about that. So let's jump into some of the usual, be quiet, spam, <laughs> sorry. Uh, let's jump into some of the usual issues. Uh, anybody in here have some Achilles tendonitis or have had some Achilles tendonitis? Anybody? Yeah. Um, common things that we do for that, you've got to loosen up the calf. The calf frequently starts to cause some problems. And remember, the calf isn't just the calf. It's the hamstring. It's the back of the butt. It's the fascia that runs all the way up your back. So loosening up the calf muscle and the rest of its fascia becomes really important for taking tension off of that Achilles tendon. 
And then when this calf muscle and the Achilles tendon isn't working well, then frequently we get some stiffnesses in the foot and those stiffnesses work their way back up to the Achilles tendon. And so what I'm saying is we're frequently mobilizing the ankle, the rest of the foot, and teaching, teaching the rest of the foot how to work well helps out the Achilles tendon. So Achilles tendonitis, uh, to say the truth about most of these things is most of these things are victims. Most of these things are symptoms of something else going on lower or something else going on up higher that we're not talking about. Most of these diagnoses are just, well, why did that happen? Um, we need to understand, well, why did that happen and why did that happen as opposed to just start with, well, I can make that feel better by putting a Band-Aid on it, whether that Band-Aid is ultrasound or ice or just stay off your leg for a while. Yes. Many times shin splints are attributed to the foot not functioning properly. Um, the most common way that that statement is the truth is because shin splints are when the, the shin muscles, front and to some extent back muscles, uh, are trying to control the, pro, the inefficient pronation of the foot. So when the foot gets very stiff, the foot has to drop into inefficient pronation, then the shin muscles are some of the muscles that are trying to control that. The other thing that shin, shin splints are actually a collection of diagnoses. Another common quote shin splint is there's a lot of force that comes up into the shins. And if the foot can't again pronate efficiently, a lot of times that force starts to cause compression into those bones. And we actually can end up with not only some shin splints, but some micro fractures up here. So shin splints are frequently a cause of um, the foot not working efficiently or sometimes the hip not working efficiently. So yeah, um, does that help answer your question? Perfect. Other questions? Beautiful. What if you have a broken foot and you get yeah. boot like and then yes. you get out of it, but it's still not strong enough to yes. stretch, what is the solution for that? Because yeah. <laughs> your body's compensated for a period of time. So the, the question is what happens when we have these injuries and traumas? Because we should absolutely brace and support and give your foot structure so that way when you get it, the bone has an opportunity to heal. Because if you don't actually put it in a cast, some sort of a cast for a while, then the bones never heal. So the short answer is we need to figure out where your foot is at. For most part, when people are in those braces, you don't start with full weight bearing exercises. You start with some seated exercises and then you load it up a little bit more and then you in standing load it up a little bit more and then load it up a little more. So basically you start out with a, a progressive exercise program that meets you where you're at. And not just in the strength component because um, the foot has gotten dumber, so to speak. You know, the coordination of the foot has decreased since it's been in the boot, appropriately so. And so for a period of time, we need to wake up that foot again and remind the foot how to, to move all those digits and all those bones. So you need to get on the floor and start to feel where those bones are. Get on the floor and start to move. I will probably lose this. Um, get on the floor and start to move that foot and control those bones. Um, that's a great question. Uh, so even if you feel pain, it depends upon quote what kind of pain it is. If I can be, if I can feel confident that you're tugging on something that's tight and it feels like, oh, that stretch really hurts so good, then I'm happy with that. If you're bumping into a pinching or a sharp pain or anything that feels like it's damaging, then usually not. And most of the time, um, I cause people a lot of pain that they're very happy with. They're like, thank you so much. That hurts so bad. Please do more of it. And they're gritting their teeth because they know that that's the part that feels good to loosen up as opposed to, ah, ugh, that's the wrong kind of discomfort. Um, so that's something that someone who's good um, should be able to lead you through. Is this, a, is this an okay pain? And the body's usually pretty good about knowing what kind of pain it is, a muscular stretch deep into the muscle as opposed to a joint kind of pinch. And almost always strength exercises work best without any pain. You should feel a muscular burn and that, that's a totally different sensation than, oh, that's my pain. 
Um, so the answer in general is no, there shouldn't be pain in that kind of way. There should just be, oh, that feels kind of nasty because you're working on something that feels good to work on. Good. Yeah, and good to work on, right? You know, one of my clients in the audience goes, yeah, that feels great. Yeah. So um, I usually don't want pain is the answer to your question, but it's got to, usually what happens is people start out too high and they can't keep good form during their exercises and because they can't keep good form, they start to cause pain that they don't want. Um, so in general, I work a whole lot more in the pain-free ranges or, uh, or the minimal discomfort ranges. Uh, and then you, you build up in mobility and you build up in strength. Yeah, good question. Others? Awesome. Loving the questions. Um, so that's a bit about Achilles tendonitis and shin splints. Anybody have had any of these? Yeah, these guys over here, some nice bunions. Yeah, uh, really common because of inefficient pronation. The foot, uh, the foot collapses in as the foot hits the ground instead of being able to roll up like this. As you were talking about, the foot frequently is forced to turn out because of maybe some tightness up here or tightness back here. Then they inefficiently pronate and then they roll off like that. And so when you roll off like that, you end up with, well, guess what? That big toe starts to get jammed out and then you end up with those. This is basically the end of a whip right here. And that whip starts all the way up at your head and frequently that whip gets compromised because of some function either in the foot or in the ankle or actually and we've not talked about the hip or the spine at all today um, because that's not the subject but frequently inefficient pronation is driven from a hip that doesn't doesn't have the ability to to twist in and when the hip doesn't have good mobility you end up with a leg that's turned out and when the leg that's turned out, you end up with a foot that can't pronate efficiently, which goes back to your comment frequently. So I'm trying to say that this is an interconnected system and this could be coming from that hip or this could be coming from a foot. Um, yeah. So other things that are frequent that the walk-in, lateral ankle sprains, we've talked a lot about today. That's those outside ankle ligaments that get ripped frequently with the foot turnover. Plantar fasciitis. Anybody um, play around with plantar fasciitis? Really common. Yeah. Um, please? Yeah, yeah. Plantar, the plantar fascia is basically this big thick ligament that goes from the heel to the front of the foot. And frequently what happens is, um, for whatever reason, a lot of chain above, but the foot starts to, again, flatten out in an inefficient way. That fascia gets too stretched, and then it starts to get inflamed because of that. Sometimes the plantar fascia will get inflamed because the Achilles or the, the ankle will get too tight. Um, frequently the remedy for plantar fasciitis, with all of these things, honestly, the first remedy, and I love this expression, if you want to get out of a hole, the first step is to stop digging. All right? If you want to get out of a hole, the first step is to stop digging. And so, so sometimes that's you've broken your leg and you need a cast on it. Sometimes that's you've got a lot of inflammation in your plantar fascia, so let's put a boot on it, especially at night. Sometimes that's you've got a bunion because your foot pronates in an inefficient way, so let's put an orthotic in there. So if you have a dysfunction, the first step is to stop digging, which means figuring out what's aggravating the problem. And when you figure out those big withdrawals out of your health, when you figure out what, how you're digging, stop digging by doing something to support the body. And so many times that's an exercise that somebody's given you. Sometimes that's you're still running and you shouldn't be running that much or you're still cycling and you just need to back up a little bit. And then the body has an opportunity to heal itself. The body does a wonderful job of starting to heal itself when we give it that opportunity. I think that's the ones I'm going to jump through. Um, and then I'm going to do a quick little case here. Um, on video and then we're gonna grab Joel. Where am I at? Yeah, we're doing good. So what I want you to see here is a patient who initially when he stood, his left leg, his left knee, his left pelvis didn't have a problem, but his right foot, well, his right knee, his right pelvis, and his right low back had quite the problem. And you'll see what happens. Let's see if that'll go. There we go. So when he relaxed, all he did is relaxed his foot would collapse in because he in standing would automatically where'd you go 
Yeah. In standing, he would automatically contract the muscles that supported the inside of this arch. Just like right now, I don't have to think about contracting my quads or my glutes or my core, or even I don't have to think about con con thinking about contracting my biceps. He automatically contracts this part of his foot, but on his right side, when he relaxed, this muscle forgot how to contract. And so what that meant is that when this professional elite, elite level professional cyclist pushed on the pedal on his left side, his efficient side, he could create a bony contact here that gave him a stable inside of his left foot. And when he pushed on the pedal on his right side, he couldn't get the ball of the foot to the ground. What that looks like is when on his, um, on his right side, he was pushing on the pedal or on the floor like this. And on the left side, when he was pushing on the pedal, he would push like this. Everyone see that? The right side, he did this. And when he pushed on the pedal like that, he did this. And when he pushed on the pedal like this, he did this. Guess which leg was happier, right? If the big toe can get to the ground, if the big toe can get to... Back up. If the big toe can get to the ball of the foot and push on the pedal efficiently, the mechanics above that are a lot better. Come back to the are you tipping question. So for him, this is what it looked like. His knee collapsed in when his foot collapsed in. His knee collapsed in when his foot collapsed in. And then you'll see him take a moment here and remind his muscle memory how to connect with the ball of his foot. And he goes, oh, that's where that muscle is. And then he would go into a backward lunge and his knee and his pelvis were a whole lot happier. This is a new movement pattern for him, one that he hadn't had in a long time. So he was a little bit wobbly with it. But this was all about brain retraining, like brain retraining. He had the mobility to be able to do it. He just had a rock in his shoe and he forgot how to use those muscles. So many of us walk around with poor movement patterns that cause lots of pain and dysfunction. Questions about that? Really important because I see a lot of people go to chiros and massage therapists doing really critical work and getting mobility of the foot or the hip or the back, but then they don't follow up with the how do you, you know, work with a personal trainer or a Pilates instructor or a physical therapist to re educate the brain and how to orchestrate these muscles so they work efficiently. So that's really critical as a second step. And then finally, the third step is once you know how to move well, you know, this guy figured out how to move well again, and then he needed to figure out how to have strength in that position and then chase down a Peloton at, you know, 35 miles an hour. Yeah, right? Okay, questions about that. Motor, that's the, my brain retraining, motor control. It's frequently lost because the body says, you, Cur Curtis, you want me to do that squat. I'll do that squat no matter how I need to do it. And on my right side, it does it efficiently. And my left foot doesn't connect as well unless I think about it. Ah, there it is. I like to think about this as a box. I just divide this into four corners here. And up here in the upper left where we start is we have a movement pattern that's incompetent. We have a movement pattern that's inefficient. We have a movement pattern that's unhealthy. And we have no clue that we're hurting ourselves. We're unconsciously incompetent. We're unconsciously incompetent. And then we move from unconsciously incompetent, and then you walk in to see someone, and they go, wow, you're moving like crap. And so we go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. And that's a really horrible place to be. I'm moving like crap, and I don't know how to change it. I'm consciously aware that I am hurting myself. So we so go from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence, and then we start to make the transition from consciously incompetent to consciously competent. In other words, and that's where my left hip is at the moment, and that's where this guy was. When I think about it, when I'm conscious, I can be competent in my movement patterns. I can move well if I think about it. It's like learning the piano. I can, I can do it well if I'm thinking about it. Actually, that's not a true statement. I can't play the piano. <laughs> Consciously competent. But con we can't be conscious all the time when we're walking down the street, when we're jumping, when we're catching a ball. So we have to move from conscious competence over to unconscious competence. 
And it's that transition that takes a whole lot of repetitions and takes a whole lot of practicing in different situations. And that's what your home exercise program is for. That's what a great personal trainer is for, is to help you move into those ways of getting your body to automatically react and do the right thing. So that way you don't have to think about it every time you put the foot on the ground, every time you catch a ball. Oops, I arched too much. Ah, there it is. So think about moving through those. I like to say initially you have bad habits that you don't know and you don't know how to control, and eventually you have good habits that you don't have to think about that make you move well. Uh, makes sense. Beautiful. Okay, let's jump into our, we're going to kill that. And did this end up working, Justin? No? Okay, we're good then. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, Okay, other questions before we jump into demo? Go ahead and slide off your shoes and come on up here for me. I'm going to move this out of the way. Bingo. And then we're going to move this in the way. Socks too, please. Um, yes, that would be great. I will take you up on that. So... We're going to spin it so it's facing that way. Yeah. And I'll scoot back a whole bunch. Yeah, that works. I will not. Yeah, you can absolutely pull that out. Okay. How comfortable do you feel standing on this? Awesome. Go ahead and hop up there for me. So Joel has um, dedicated his feet and his body. And, of course, this is a very... Do we have anything to make this more, uh, less squishy, something, some plank I could put on it, or uh, maybe a big box? The other ones are not as squishy as that back there. Yeah, true, but um, yeah, that would be great, actually. Would that, um, would that cause a dent in the foam that I would be a problem? What's that? Oh, use a box instead. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'm going to be using both. Let's go this way with it. Thank you for that. That's so much better. Thank you, Pete. And it's a good idea. Okay. <laughs> Jeff, did I do that again? Hey, yeah, I keep calling him Pete, and I'm sorry, Jeff. Hop up here for me. Pete goes by Jeff. Pete goes by Jeff. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'll call you Steve next. <laughs> Joel, I'll, I'll answer to you'll answer anything, Joel. Thank you. Um, so, Joel walks in with a couple of issues in your foot, and remind me what those are for the crowd. Uh, so I get pain on the lateral side of the left foot, especially yep. when cycling. Yep. Um, and I've got this big old bony overgrowth at the base of my big toe there. That's impressive. you got a little alien coming out there. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and can you see that? Beautiful. Okay, let me grab something here. Where did... There it is. Beautiful. And then some dots. So... Um, what I want you to see with Joel, and I'm going to be standing behind him here for a moment, is the shape of his left foot versus the shape of his right foot. And what I mean by that is if I drew a triangle on Joel's foot starting here and running down there, can you see how this foot sets relatively like that? He's got a little bit of a transverse arch. He's got a little bit of a medial arch here, but it's relatively stacked. It's a relatively vertical foot. And the distance or the, the space underneath this bone here, underneath this bone here, the navicular, is pretty good. And if I slide and just keep your foot where it's at and just relax, if I slide my finger, just relax, and I lift up, no, no, stay relaxed. If I lift up the outside of his foot and I lift up the inside of his foot, he's pretty balanced. Um, what we do, will you grab the pressure map for me? Yeah. Um, what we do here at the clinic is we actually have pressure maps that go underneath the foot and we can visually see this balance. But he's pretty balanced. The outside is pretty heavy and the inside is pretty heavy. He's got pretty equal weight. Does that resonate for you? Okay. And then I come over here and it's, I'll go backwards. If I lift up the inside of his foot versus I try to lift up the inside of his foot, this side is just much easier to lift up than that side is versus and I come out here this is very heavy versus that's much lighter what I'm trying to say here is that Joel imagine this is his imagine this is a left foot for a moment Joel is very heavy on the outside of his foot over here um, 
And when we did the pressure mapping inside of his shoe, the, the last in-service we saw, we saw how heavy he was out here. Does that resonate for you? And that's some of the discomfort you get. So his foot is essentially, and again, imagine this is his uh, left foot. From his, so his foot is essentially hitting the ground hard on the outside, but then that leaves his big toe up here. So then his body has to do that in order to get to the ground, but it's still going to be heavy on the outside. Does that make sense for everybody? Is this efficient pronation? No, this is tipping. And if you look at the angle of this foot, come back to where I was before, this foot is stacked relatively vertically. You see that this foot started vertical and then all of a sudden it collapsed in. It has this, it looks a lot, and it's flatter because this is down and it's also flatter because it's done that. This is kind of a leaning tower of Pisa, if you will. You can see that. And that's why he's so much heavier here. If I measure the distance between his heel and his foot on this side, and his heel and his big toe on this side, this would be much shorter. This arch on the inside has gotten relatively long. Shift the most of your weight over to this side for me, and then lift up this heel a little bit. Um, are you stable up there? Okay, great. Lift up this heel a little more. If I put his foot, give me a moment to do this, there we go, right there. And then slowly drop that heel for me. Slowly drop that heel. There we go. There. Yeah, that's an out. There we go. Good. If I put his foot there, does that look any different than what it did a minute ago? Yeah. You, and from this angle, it looks a lot more like the right. Because what I just did is I... And you know, of course, he can't stay like this. I just manhandled, pun intended, um, his foot to make it look a little bit more neutral. Um, I got his heel bone a little bit more vertical. I asked the outside of his foot to be a, a little bit longer. There we go. And then I got the ball of his foot back a little bit closer. I've shortened the inside arch and I've lengthened the outside arch. But in order to do that, I was tugging on a whole bunch of mechanical passive tightness in order to bring him into, let's say, 40% of efficient or neutral. And what happens here, shift most of your weight onto the left side. There you go. Pause right there for me. Let me actually give you a visual of this. And will that run? Let's see. There we go. Sort of that run. I didn't check this. You can kind of see it. You'll probably be able to see it easier just watching it. Give me a moment. I should have dotted you up beforehand. There you go. So what I want you to notice here is as he shifts his weight onto this left side with his foot in a slightly better position, what happens to his knee? Just start a tiny squat here. Just a tiny squat. I'm watching your knee there and then come back up and then go down again and come back up. And now shift your weight onto your right side. Lift up this foot for me. There you go. And then let it set back down and then let it relax back down. Shift your weight back over here and then start that squat for me again. Is that any different? And then back down again. Pause right there. Look at the relationship between his knee and his ankle here. Yeah. And I want you to get a sense of your strength here on that leg. And then come on all the way back up. Lift up this heel again. And just let me move you. Lift up the heel a little more. There we go. And then let that sit back down. Perfect. There. And then shift your weight over to that side again. Yeah. And then start that squat again. And does that change the mechanics of his knee at all? Yeah. As I let go of his foot, watch what happens to his knee. Yeah. Can you see how the foundation here, yeah, how the foundation here twists his way up into his knee? Is that visible from out there? Yeah, perfect. So what I need to do then is go, well, why is that? Um, and I'm going to now get him on the table to answer some of that question. Why is that? Why is his foot heavy on the outside? Why is his foot, instead of, his right foot is, a, is pronating because he's got some weight on it, but when it pronates, it flattens out. His left foot does a tipping. So I'm going to have you lay on the table here for me. <laughs> I saw that thought. 
And we're going to move this over a bunch. Thank you for that. Perfect. And then lie down here face up. Bend up this. Can people see his foot? Sort of? Yeah. We'll do that. Sort of. Yeah, beautiful. And you see his foot. Yeah. So again, on the right foot, I look at this right foot, and it very easily has the ability to get the ball of his foot down and keep his arch. He's got good mobility of the front of his foot, and he's got good mobility of... Let me see if I can't get out of your way. He's got good mobility of the outside of his foot to be able to kind of twist in. I come over here and I put this foot, I put this ankle in a neutral position. I put this ankle in a neutral position and there's good mobility. I put this ankle in a neutral position and I say, are you able to mechanically go to the floor? And the body goes, not really. Uh, very different. Yeah, Joel says, I'll give you the visual here. Ankle is in a neutral position on the right side. His right side says, oh, yeah, not a problem. This forefoot and this midfoot has the ability to, in PT language, evert, if you will, tip down, and if you will, externally rotate on his right side. I put his left ankle in a neutral position, and you can actually just see it. Put his right ankle in a neutral position. He pretty much stays neutral here. I bring this bone in a neutral place, and it's quite stiff. Yeah, it can't get over. And that bone out there, that bone on the outside of the foot and this outside line is also quite stiff. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, so the first, the first step in the process of getting better is what? What do we need to do? Loosen up. You know, get some of these mechanical tightnesses a little bit better, a little bit looser. And uh, what way do I want to pick on you today? I think I'm going to, uh, yeah. Yeah, that too. Okay. The, um, uh, you can see it from here. If I put Joel's foot here, if you look at this bottom bone, this heel bone, the rudder of the foot, if you will, this rudder is relatively vertical. It's not tipped in and it's not tipped out, just with me hanging onto his foot. If I lift up this foot, and you see how that heel is, yeah, kind of twisted in. And if I ask this heel, I talk to the body a lot, if I ask the seal, hey, heel, are you willing to tip out? It goes, not without yanking on the knee, I'm not. Ow, oh, sorry. I'll be a lot nicer. So this, ow. So this heel doesn't have, I love you, knee. I love you, knee. This heel doesn't have the ability to tip out. It's basically stuck in this inverted or tipped in position. I'll come back over here. Where this one, you know, he can get that baby out pretty easily. Yeah, you can see the difference there. So this foot not only has a front of the foot that's tipped in, that's dropping in, it also has a back of the foot that's tipped in and then dropping in. This is a foot that's going to hurt, probably yeah. on the bike. Yeah, yeah. So interesting story. Yeah. I bought a bike. Bought a bike. I bought a mountain bike. Yes. And I bought the bike where I didn't hit my knee on the top two. Yes. And it didn't occur to me until just now that the reason I'm hitting the top two is probably all of yeah, so he bought a mountain bike and um, and the knee didn't hit the top tube. And on this side, you never hit the top tube. And on the left side, he's hit the top tube. And now we understand that with this foot collapse, it's probably what was driving this knee in. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're very welcome. And where am I at? Beautiful. Okay, so uh, let's, um, let's change this a little bit. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to have you hop off for me for a minute. And I'm going to scoot this out that way, just a hair. There you go. And you're going to lie down. That's your left foot. You're going to lie down on your right side facing that way. There we go. And this knee's going to bend up. I'm going to get my better side to you here. I'm just going to bring this up this way. So the first thing I need to do is help this heel move a little bit better. I'll uh, loosen up the subtalar joint and give me a moment for that when we um, mobilize joints uh, we meaning the uh, organization I one of the organizations I teach for the Institute of Physical Art Joel push down your foot there you go and relax 
when we mobilize joints and soft tissues, we don't um, just passively manipulate them. Push down again and relax. And then again and relax. We encourage the body to move itself quite a bit by having people engage their muscles, meaning push down, Joel, and then relax. Beautiful. What I'm working on here is that that heel bone, the rudder of the foot's ability to be able to, yeah, there it is one more time, and then relax. Good. The rudder of the foot and its ability to be able to, yeah, tip a little bit. You can probably see it's actually starting to, huh, interesting, eh? Your foot hasn't done that probably in a while. Good. And then, go ahead and lay on your stomach for me. The next thing um, is the outside line of his foot on this side. This side, this outside line, this lateral arch, if you will. This arch has the ability to really lengthen and open, where this one just doesn't nearly as well, because that joint right there probably feels a fair bit different than that one. Is that true for you? Right there. So he feels tenderness right here because there's a bone right here called your cuboid bone. And then the bone right in front of it, that fifth metatarsal, there's a stuck spot right there. And I'm just going to take a moment in this position to mobilize that. Just gently push your foot into me and then relax. Good. And then push your foot down again and relax. There we go. And then push your foot down again and relax, there it went, much better. And then that starts to elongate a bit. Actually, there's one more that's right there. Push your foot down gently, there you go, and then relax, beautiful. So that's part number two. So once we start to get mobility in the foot, and lay on your back for me, what's the third step? If number one is mobility, number two is, I heard it? Neuromuscular and motor control. So you're going to see me do that in a minute. I've got one more area to loosen up on this foot. Bend up this knee again. Lift up this foot for me. And if I put his ankle in neutral, you can still see that the front of the foot, these bones right in here are twisted up. And these bones need to be able to, especially that one right there, needs to be able to twist down. Let your knee fall to the outside for me. Yeah, right. There it is. Start to do a little heel lift there for me, Joel. Push the front of your foot down into the foam roller like you're lifting up. There you go. And then relax and then go again and relax and go again and relax. Perfect. And then um, take your knee to the outside a little and then back to the inside and outside a little and back to the inside and outside a little hold there for me there it goes and relax and so now i hold his ankle in a relatively <laughs> i hold his ankle in a relatively neutral position and i'm able to start to get the front of that foot down to the ground so if number one is get mobility and now he's got some of that number two joel in a moment bend up this knee for me joel and i'm going to put your foot right there in a moment, I'm going to let go of your foot. Your job is to hold that position exactly. Keep that there for me, right there. Feel that ball of the foot and make sure that ball of the foot doesn't move anywhere. Keep that ball of the foot right there. Perfect. That's starting to wake his, up his brain's ability to use his pro peroneus longus, his tibialis posterior, a little bit of his fibularis. That's remarkably difficult. That's remarkably difficult. Stay there for me. And if I say, don't let me lift up this this one, hold there, is there any difference between the two sides? There's a, a little bit of difference or a lot? There's a lot of difference between those two sides. Why do you think there's a lot of difference between those two sides? It's been a long time since he's used that motion. If I took a, stay there for me, if I took a brace off my elbow and that brace has been on my elbow for even just a couple of weeks, the brain forgets how to use those muscles. Keep holding there. So his brain says, how in the world do I do that movement? So he's starting to wake up there quite nicely. Let's make it a little more functional. Do a little bridge for me here. Keep that ball of the foot down. Keep that ball of the foot down. There you go. I'm just going to give him a little bit more resistance to connect in his hip and to connect in his core. Keep that knee there. 
Hold that knee. Let your pelvis drop back down a little bit and then lift back up. Keep that knee out because this is how strong this leg is. Hold that there. Feel the strength of that one and then feel the strength of that one. Yeah. Because his foot hasn't been able to provide a strong foundation, the whole chain has gotten weaker. And then back up again. There you go. And one more time. And back up again. That professional cyclist, and relax back down, and we're going to stand on that again. That professional cyclist that you saw earlier, that was his need. His need was to be able to learn how to control that foot. I'll get that. Oh, you can get it. Or we can get it. Let's do this. Thank you. Marvelous. And then hop back up. Ha <laughs> ha Ah, yay. Does that look any different? Yeah, thank you. Um, so what looks different about that? Anybody? Yeah, his arch is a little bit better, right? The, the distance here is shorter, and I wish I had measured that. Um, this navicular bone isn't as dropped down as it was. I also, what else do you see? He, more vertical. The foot is more vertical. He's not quite tipped in so much. He's not um, the leaning tower of Pisa as much as he was. I would say that's changed by 30, maybe even 50%. Anything else? His midfoot looks different right through here. Um, I see this being more relaxed. It's not so cramped up to the outside. Yeah, um, That's a big part of what I did is to loosen this up so that way the big toe could get down versus being stuck up. And now I think, yeah, so now it's hard for me to lift that up and he's not, he's not thinking about it. Is that true? And now it's a whole lot easier for me to lift up the outside. Is that true for you? So my suspicion is the next time you get on the bike, though you're going to need to think about this for a while, you'll be able to find the ball of your foot. And then that's going to, you're going to be able to find the ball of your foot without twisting your knee. Uh, as you start to find the ball of your foot and the pressure goes through there, you're going to have less pressure through the outside. So now, with, again, without thinking about it, shift your weight a little bit to the left. There you go. And then start that little bit of a squat. Yay. And is that any different? Yeah. Yeah, right? That was kind of yeah, surprising. I didn't think I'd made that much of a change. Go one more time for me. Perfect. Pause there. What he doesn't have, however, stay there for me. Hold. Don't let me move this knee. This foot is quite strong and connected. This foot is still trying to figure out how to be strong and be connected. So he's going to need to hook up with a trainer. He's going to need to do some home exercises to start to connect his butt to his foot and to start to connect his core to his butt to his foot. He also needs more mobility down here because if he goes home and he does his home exercises for mobility, he does his home exercises for neuromuscular coordination, he'll keep most, if not all of this, but we've got a couple more levels to work through. And that's to get back good form. And then he's got a good three to six months of strength training on top of that to be able to climb a hill at fast pace without any discomfort and with good power. And that's got to be something that the person's really committed to because we can loosen up things. We can even help wake up things. But in the long term, if you don't get good strength and if you don't get good endurance, you fall back into your old movement patterns, which your body is so good at. So that is, um, this could be for a cyclist as Joel is. Um, this could be for someone who just walks because every time he shifts weight over to this leg, he's going to collapse and twist into his knee or into his hip. This could be for someone who has low back problems. Uh, relax here because before when this foot would twist in and I didn't show it to you when the foot twists in the pelvis twists in and that puts a lot of stress on the low back so again the foundation is just really critical literally and figuratively the foundation is critical and usually when we have one dysfunction if it's been living here long enough that accommodation and that dysfunction is spread and usually I need to treat you know two things at once as opposed to just one thing questions about this Wow, beautiful. Um, exercises I would give him for home. Grab a seat for me for a moment. What's that? I don't know. So um, exercises I would give him for home. Number one, his feet would be on the ground, but I would take a, a lacrosse ball, um, a tennis ball if somebody's really sore, or a, um, a golf ball, and put it underneath his foot, and particularly on that line, and just have him roll on that. So... And I don't have my ball handy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. The ball is under the table. 
right there. Perfect. So I would have him roll on that ball and just start rolling around there. In particularly where I found him to be tightest at, which is this mid-tarsal roll row out here on the cuboid and in here on the cuneiforms to start to loosen this stuff up. The second place, and I didn't get to address it very much, as a little bit of stiffness coming into his heel bone and the muscles that attach to the heel bone, a la the calf and the Achilles, I'd have him do some massage into his calf. You can roll on a foam roller in there. You can get the, the stick, that rolling tool to get in the calf. So number one, I would work on mobility, and that's going to be important for him. And then number two, I would work on some motor control, some coordination. So for Joel, what that's going to mean, I'm going to steal your foot here, either in um, lying on his back like I did a minute ago, or sitting, or sometimes standing, I would work on this ability for the ball of the foot to get to the ground. Um, let's do that. Let's do that up here. It'll be a little bit easier to see. Now lying on your back. Thank you. That's great. I think it's easier to see up here, lying on your back. And again, this could be in sitting, standing, or even on the bike. What I say is, Joel, this foot likes to live out here and it likes to tip in. Your job, and I'm going to move you, your job is to find that position. Now, there's a couple of different ways to kind of cheat and find it. Probably the easiest is lift up your toes all the way. And when you lift up your toes, what it does is engage, and your foot's flat, but just your toes. There you go. So when you lift up your toes, what it does is stretch on that plantar fascia. And when you lift up your toes, it brings you naturally into a good arch. Now, Joel, keeping your toes up for a moment, start to let the foot drop down. So now the ball of the foot is connected to the ground. Now you're going to relax your toes, keeping that arch. There we go. Now he's just set his foot like this, he's lifted up his, he started, he started here, he lifted up his toes, he got neutral, and now he's got his foot in the neutral position. And now what you're gonna do is you're gonna do a bridge, you're gonna do a little hip lift, and when you do that, I want you to see if you can't keep the ball of your foot engaged into the table. Now it's a little bit hard here because this is so squishy. Keep the ball of your foot engaged into the, engage, there it is. And sometimes I'll even put a, um, we even put something small underneath it, like a coin, like a quarter, so they can feel themselves pushing down on it. Sometimes I'll have them do this in sitting and put a towel underneath the foot and try to pull the towel out from underneath the big toe. So, Joel, my, my finger is a towel. Don't let me pull that towel out. There you go. Beautiful. That works really nicely. And this whole time, he's thinking about A, engaging in the ball of the foot, but he's doing a really nice job of not doing this. That is the most common. They will try to get to the ball of their foot by dropping their knee in. You want the ball of the foot to go down, and when the ball of the foot goes down, it lifts the inside. It makes it so it, um, it doesn't tip in. So go ahead and it's interesting because this is lighting up to do that. Because the butt is lighting up to do that. Yeah. yeah. So remember that. So many people walk in and say, my butt doesn't work. And particularly when I push on a pedal or when I run, there is a lot of mechanical and neural connections that make it so when you push on the ball of the foot, the glute works better. Um, and you can go into the neurology of that. But basically, a lot of people can't get into their glute because their foot isn't working efficiently. So this is a nice place to play with this, basically bridging with a neutral foot. Another place to play with this, and I'll just do this up here myself. Assume I'm in sitting, and um, assume I'm in sitting, lift up the toes, find the ball of the foot, and then do heel raises. Heel raises are incredibly easy, except most people do them wrong or do them wrong. Lift up the heel and keep a neutral arch. When this gets easy, you can do the same thing in standing. When this gets easy, you can add some resistance kind of pulling into the foot. But basically, the idea is how do I start to plant through this foot and keep this inside foot connected so that I don't collapse? Are you keeping your toes up while you do that? Uh, no. Uh, so toes, 
Yeah, and it's actually, eventually, I don't want you to have to lift your toes at all. I just want you to be able to go, oh, there it is. Um, but it's a nice way to find it or kind of cheat the find, so to speak. Sometimes I'll also, I'm not going to go there, but lifting the toes helps find it and then relax them back down. And then you should really be able to stand on and get weight through that foot. I'm right there. I should be able to get weight through that foot and put a whole lot of load through that, beep, whole lot of load through that leg. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, you let them back down. Yeah, great question. So the toes up is just you start there as a way to find it, and then you let the toes relax, and then you do the heel lift. Uh, and when you're doing this heel lift, again, the whole time, you're making sure that your knee's not going outside and it's not going inside. You're really training neutral. And I'm not saying, for the trainers in the room, I'm not saying that you should keep neutral all the way through life. The body isn't that way. But to train um, neutral mechanics first, and then you live outside of that as well. So you start by training the body to do it efficiently, and then you make it harder from there. Good. Other questions? Yeah, awesome. Okay. I think, yeah, I think that's a good place. Um, I'm here for questions afterward. Um, anybody online want to send questions, feel free. Um, but that's a, so we have a what the foot part two, and that's actually going to be um, treatment, meaning we're going to have small groups come in. I'm basically going to do what I just did with Joel to some extent. We're going to do some exercises with um, some trainers here. And it's just going to be small groups. And then our what the foot part three is taking this onto the bike. And how do we evaluate this on the bike? We'll get out some pressure maps and you'll be able to see how Joel's foot is putting pressure down onto the pedal. And then how do you accommodate for that on the bike? So three parts, what the foot one, two, and three. And then the other thing we have is an open house. And that's on a day. It's Sunday. It's a Saturday on your list there. It's Sunday, November Sunday, October 20th is the open house. You can sit up. The workshop is Sunday, November 3rd. 9 to 2 limited space. Thank you for being my memory. Okay. Yeah, seriously. Okay, um, please ask questions after and please ask questions online. This lecture will be available online either through Facebook and we'll be sending it out and we can send out the PowerPoint if anybody's interested in that as well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks.